I want to welcome you to our study today. Uh, this, it is entitled, Secure Your Future, and this is the second part of this series. I think I will only have one other after today, but to me, these are probably some of the most important messages that I've preached in a long time. I began this series with a very bold statement last week, and I said this, if you stay with me through this mini-series, I believe that you will have everything necessary to secure your future. Can I just say, say to you, I am still standing by this statement. I believe this. By the time this series is done, if you've kept up with it, I think you're going to be surprised what God begins to do and how you sense that He gives you the equipment and everything you need for your future. Now, in our first lesson, we learned that if we make God's Word number one in our lives, we secure our future. Psalm 1, verses 2 through 4 says, But those uh, who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on His law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, listen now, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Listen to this. I love this. And whatever they do prospers. Amen. How many of you want to prosper in this day we're in? I've got every intention of prospering in every way, regardless of what's going on in our world. By the way, this includes your family, your children, your marriage, your business, your ministry, your job, and I love this one, and even your health. Amen. Verse 4 says uh, that this is not so of the wicked. It, here, here's what it says. And, and that psalm is a contrasting. It says, this is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. And I explained all of that last week. It, basically, and let me just tell you, this has been my experience in pastoring for quite a few years now. Everything that the wicked and the unbeliever does comes to naught. And in the end, everything that they set out to do is absolutely blown away. So in this teaching, today I want to show you how the Word of God claims special powers. For example, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints, and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Did you notice what this verse says? It says that, that the Word of God is alive and it is active. Notice what else he said. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. My father, uh, when he was alive, and that sword's still somewhere around. I don't know where it is, but he purchased... Uh, he was always buying, selling, and trading things. He purchased a, a, a bona fide samurai sword. Now, I don't know how many of you know much about a samurai sword, but the way it is designed, it is absolutely one of the sharpest uh, swords uh, on planet Earth. They, they, they know how to fine-tune this thing and get an edge on it that literally, uh, you know, you just don't want to mess with the samurai sword, in other words. But notice it says it divides between the soul and the spirit. Now, again, the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. And that, that's where we as humans have a lot of problems. The soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. The spirit of the born-again person is where the Holy Spirit resides. So there's a, there's a difference between the soul of man and the spirit of man. But, uh, bottom line, you and I are a spirit. You are a spirit. That's the reason, folks, when you die physically, if you've been around death, and some of you have, you instantaneously recognize that when that person passes from this life, that is the shell, that is the, 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 the instrument that carried the real you around. And when it is no longer needed, it dies. Come on, amen. Somebody say, that's kind of scary, Pastor. Well, listen, it's about 100%, so we better start recognizing that. Last time I checked, everybody who's born on planet Earth uh, you know, I, I, had, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I had one really religious dude one time after I preached this, and I was so proud. And I said, you know, it's 100%. And they came up to me and said, Pastor, I'm sorry to tell you. There were two supernatural resurrections in the Bible. And they named uh, the people who were translated. And I thought, well, how wonderful is that? Did you miss the point? <laughs> I think they missed the point. Notice it says, he judges, 
and discerns the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Here it is in the Amplified Bible. In fact, the Amplified Classic Bible says, For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul, and, listen, the immortal spirit. Folks, how many of you realize when you and I pass from this life, our spirit immediately exits our body and we go into eternity. So the immortal spirit and of joints and marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. When you and I read, when we study or meditate in God's Word, listen to this, we are literally interacting with a supernatural book. It's supernatural. It's not like sitting down and reading a history book or reading uh, the Reader's Digest or, or whatever, some magazine. This Bible that God created and came up with and breathed his life in is a supernatural book. And by the way, let me just say some of you may be thinking, well, I read the Bible and it's dead to me. Listen, you need the help of the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit read. It's a spirit book. And you can only interpret and understand the Bible with the help of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I mean you know, that's true. Say amen. amen. Now, there's an explanation for this. This supernatural book, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And I hope you stay with me because I'm going to get to the meat of this in just a moment. And I'm telling you, it's going to encourage you. But here's what it says. All Scripture is God-breathed, inspired, and is useful, listen now, for teaching, a rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, verse 17, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Folks, let me just say this. The Bible is encouragement. It gives us strength. But let me just tell you, not everything about the Bible always going to make you feel good. Right? Sometimes we need a little correction. Sometimes we need a little rebuking. Now, we don't like that in America. We want everything uh, the way we interpret it to be up, 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 and no sad news, no bad anything. Well, let me tell you something. If you're going to walk with God every now and then, you're going to need correcting. You're going to need rebuking. Can I hear an amen on that today? Amen. Verse 17 says, So that the servant of God may thir be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the Greek word inspired here is theonoustos. Theo means God. Theo means God. Neustos means nostril or breath of God. Now, I'm going to try to give you some illustrations today that will help you understand what God literally did when, when the Word was created. For example, in the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam and Eve from the earth, the Bible says that God breathed His life into them. Now, again, going back, and I don't want to get too gruesome here, but folks, listen. Adam looked just like a man that really had nothing to offer when he was lying there. God created him out of the ground and out of the earth and out of the elements there. But then what did God do? He breathed life into Adam. So it is with the Bible. God has literally breathed his breath into the Bible. Now, let me again read these two verses, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 to you. Again, it says, every or all Scripture is God-breathed. It's given by His inspiration. Listen now. And profitable, profitable for instruction, for reproof, listen, and conviction of sin for correction of error and discipline in obedience and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action. And again, verse 17 says, So that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want to give you another illustration. And if for any reason you had a bad night and you're kind of drifting off or you're, or you're already thinking about this week, I want you to, I want you to grab your mind, uh, get, get your mind to listen to what I'm about to say to you. Because here's, here's the best illustration that I have ever heard regarding God's Word. I want you to envision a balloon. A balloon that has, well, a, a birthday balloon or, or a big party balloon. 
whatever comes to your mind, I want you to think about that. And um, I want you to think about some things here. First, as you blow into the balloon, what happens to that balloon? Little bit by little bit, it begins to take on a new shape. Folks, listen, when you start interacting with the Word of God, hearing it preached, reading it, studying it, whatever form you hear it in, let me tell you, little bit by little bit by little bit, you start growing and looking more like God wants you to look. Amen? Secondly, when I blow up a balloon, my breath is in the balloon. In other words, the breath of God is in His Word. How many of you can see that? How many of you can just see God? Blowing into the Bible. How many of you can see him doing that to Adam? <sighs> he blows his life into it. But thirdly, and this is what I want you to get, there's more. When I blow up a balloon, or you blow up a balloon, you know, what's, you know what happens? Your DNA, my DNA is in this balloon. It's not just air. It's not just something balloon. And, and folks, listen. God breathed his DNA into the Bible. I hope you're grasping what I'm telling you this morning. So when we, so when we partake of God's word, we are literally taking in, listen, uh, into ourself the DNA of God himself. His character, His qualities, and even the personality of the Lord Himself. Now let that sink in for just a little bit. When you interact with the Word of God and when you use the Word of God, literally, uh, 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 your, His DNA is in it. Amen? You still listening? This is why speaking His Word is so powerful. You've got a choice every single morning to get up and speak life or get up and speak death. You can get up and thank God and praise God for another day or you can get up and curse everything that's wrong in the world and in your life and in your body. And you know what? You're going to get that. You're going to get a cursed life. You're going to get an unhappy, sad, sour life. And nobody's going to want to be around you. But I'm telling you, folks, if we learn the power in the Word of God and speak it over the situations of our life, let me tell you, we are literally breathing out God's DNA into the world. Amen? In other words, the very atmosphere and conditions of your home your marriage, your children, thank God for that, your health, and even your finances can be changed through the breath of God contained in scriptures and, and as they are being released from your mouth. Now, folks, if we ever grasp that and, and, and understand the power of the Word of God and, and, and speak it into situations. Now, folks, that doesn't mean we can't ever get real with our friends and say, hey, I'm hurting. Here's what's going on in my life. I want you to know this, and, and I need your prayers. There's a big difference in calling on the saints to pray with you, encourage you, and help you. But it's a whole other thing to make a negative talk and, and devil talk and all kinds of things uh, a, a part of your life. Some people just do that. You, you ever walk away from somebody and just say, Lord, have mercy. I love that person, but... Man, they're, 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 they're oppressed. They're oppressed to be around you. Ever, I, I don't want people to say that when I leave, and I hope to God they don't. Don't ever admit it to me. Don't ever confess it around me. <laughs> Let me tell you something else God's DNA has the power to do. God's DNA has the power to destroy addictions and family traits. I'm talking about the bad family traits that... That, that all of us somewhere in our gene pool have some traits that if God doesn't sanctify them, we're, we're not the best of people. Can you hear me on that one? I'm just going to tell you something, folks. Our, our, our world is labeling everything now, this and that, and putting some diagnosis on everything. And let me tell you, those things are true, and there are things that people really suffer from. But if you want to get healed, I've been healed through God's Word and, uh, and the revelation of God's Word, through the DNA of God's Word more than anything else in my life. I've, I've gone to counseling. I've gone to, well, I'm just not going to do this anymore. I'm going to set my will. Let me tell you, I've been delivered and set free. And now some of you may be getting a glimpse of why the devil fights you so hard to get in the Word. And you really want to. 
And you make a decision to do that. But boy, the next thing you know, you are a little discouraged. You will want to hear this next series after this one that I'm going to tell you how to do these things and make them a part of your life. Amen? Now, the last day society, listen very carefully, will be full of people who have been traumatized, wounded, and who desperately need the puma or the inspiration of God. Scripture has the power to revive these numbed souls and and can cause them to be living and, and, and be a driving force once again in life. Amen. Folks, listen, church in America needs to get back to the Word, needs to get back to the Bible. And if you get your cho- toes stepped on every now and then, uh, you probably got a good preacher if you got one that offends you every now and then. Get your mail, I ain't going to go listen to that guy anymore. He just points out all my problems. You know, you don't, I've had people say, boy, you're preaching at me today. I, I didn't know that. I think it's the Lord preaching at you. I told you, if you give the Holy Spirit an inch, he'll take a mile. That's funny. I don't care who you are. Now listen to verse 17. It says, So that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well-fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. I hope you're going to stay with me in this segment. By the way, Tracy could not be here. She just was not feeling up to it. And, but she, at one time when I was preaching this, she came up with a saying. And here is this saying. She said, if you're equipped, you're not going to be whipped. Now, that's a positive person. The negative person says, if you're not, uh, if you're not equipped, you're going to be whipped. I mean, you know, it's true either way. If you're equipped, you're not going to be whipped. But the reverse is true. Folks, listen, I love you, but there's a lot of whipped people around today. And we'd get in this Bible and get in this Word. I'm telling you, it would solve a lot of our problems. Amen. In my little apple box again. Uh, If America would get back to the Word of God, the church would get back to the Word of God, I think things would really turn around in this nation. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us that at the very end of this age, it will begin to be filled with unprecedented levels of stormy weather. God has given us what we need to help us successfully sail through the tumultuous season that's on the horizon. His word, if believed, embraced, and acted upon, will release its supernatural ability to outfit any person with all the equipment needed to sail victoriously through the turbulence of the last day storm. Now listen to this. The phrase, thoroughly equipped, I'm probably going to do great damage to the Greek language is zardzo. But it literally pictures a simple boat that was previously ill-equipped, ill-equipped for long-distance sailing or rough waves until its owner decked it out with new equipment and gear. Consequently, that simple boat was transformed and became thoroughly equipped to sail a long distance and through any type of bad weather. Can we say thank God for it? Amen. Now, now folks, listen. Jesus may come. He may rapture us out. But He may not. He may not come as quickly as we think He's going to come, right? So we better get thoroughly equipped. We better get our little sailing boat equipped so when these rough waters happen, we're already entering into some of those in this country. Wouldn't you agree? There's a few problems in America right now. But there's a second reason for this power uh, found in the Word of God or or spoken of about the Word of God. Listen carefully. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 through 21. Peter says this. Listen, he's, he's talking to us today. Above all... You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that the same is true of those who wrote the Scriptures? They were inspired of God for a season. How many of you know Scripture has been written and we're not to rewrite any more Scriptures? Amen? 
And you need to be real careful when someone says, well, the Lord said to me, and, and, and he does talk to us, but when it doesn't line up with Scripture, you need to let something go off in you and say, uh, 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 uh. I mean, I hear, oh, the Lord said. In other words, I've got a new revelation that adds to the Word of God. Run. Run. But nevertheless, those who God anointed uh, in these divine moments, these individuals temporarily became the instrument through whom God expressed His heart and His will. Now listen to this. Uh, let me for just a moment, uh, and I'm going somewhere again, and we, we don't like a, a great deal more, but I want you to listen. I want to talk to you just for a moment about the oneness of the Bible. The oneness or unity of the Bible is a miracle. It is a library of 66 books written by uh, over 35, it's really more like 40 different authors in a period of approximately 1,500 years. It's represented, or represented in the authors is a cross-section of humanity, educated, uneducated, including kings, fishermen, uh, public officials, farmers, teachers, and physicians. Included in the subjects are religion, history, law, science, poetry, drama, biography, and prophecy. Yet its various parts are as harmoniously united as the parts that make up the human body. For 35 authors with such varied backgrounds to write on so many subjects over a period of approximately 1,500 years in absolute harmony is a mathematical impossibility. In other words, it could not happen. So then how do we account for the Bible? The only adequate explanation is that men were moved by the Holy Spirit uh, as uh, uh, they were moved by the Holy Spirit and spoke from God. Amen? And we can all be anointed to speak God's word and speak, but they were anointed of God to create the Word of God and God breathed in that. Now, Stay with me for a few more minutes. We're living in a time where there are a large number of skeptics and unbelievers. I'm beginning to encounter more and more people. Yeah, I know, it's a, you know, I know that Bible stuff. Yeah, I know all that. And they're beginning to refer to the Bible. And actually, this is not new. People have been doing it forever. But more and more people are beginning to buy into it. And they'll just tell you that the Bible is just a book of fairy tales or myths. And at best, it is allegorical illustrations. You need to know a lot of the world is buying into this today. Skeptics will argue that the oneness and the inaccuracy of Scripture, they'll, they'll tell you it's not accurate and that it is not complete in one. And, and they are claiming that there are many discrepancies in God's Word. This is absolutely important for you to hear what I'm about to say. What they fail to understand is that the only discrepancies are in the translation of the Bible to, from Hebrew and Greek uh, to the English language. That's where the problem is. Folks, let me tell you, of all the languages in the world, the English language doesn't do very well. For example, Greek, uh, in Greek they can explain one word with five different definitions. Uh, or, or, or actually in America. And, and we tend to think, well, okay, I read the Bible, and uh, what about this over here? That, that, that acts like it contradicts. You need to understand that the English language falls way short in being able to properly translate the Word of God from Hebrew to Greek. Everybody understand the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And the New Testament is written in Greek. I encourage every serious student of the Bible to get a concordance. And, uh, you, you, and, and if you don't understand what a word means, you can get all kinds of Bible studies now. Uh, aids that will help you understand, but a concordance. And, and you can learn when you look up that word. You know, you know, the King James Bible uses a lot of strange words. At least in my... Oh, boy, I probably offended somebody then. I, I didn't say I didn't like the King James Version. You know what I'm saying? Just words they used in King James. I'm about to get myself in trouble here, I can tell. And you need to look some of those words up. By the way, you can download just about any of these things on a smart device today. I've got a concordance on my, on my uh, uh, smart device, on all of them, where I want to know what a word means, I go and look it up. But I want to start kind of concluding with this. 
I want to just mention to you briefly the importance that God puts on the Bible. Listen very carefully to Psalms 138 verse 2. It says, For you have magnified your word above all your name. I mean, you know, one of the first commandments that God gave man is you're not to defile the name of God. You're not to misuse the name of God. The name of God was so reverent to the Hebrew nation, they don't even mention the name of God in certain contexts. God says, For you have magnified your word above all your name. Psalm 119 uh, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Folks, listen, it's not going to change. God's word is not changing. Jesus Christ, yeah, come on, give him some praise, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the word. In fact, the days we are entering to, are the only stable thing that you can count on is going to be the stability of the word of God. And that includes America. Unless we have a bona fide revival, a heaven-sent, God-sent awakening revival, you better get in the Word of God and you better know it well because all the world's nations seem to be going further and further away from God. But guess what? God's Word is not changing. It is forever settled in heaven. Amen? Amen. You know, there are two things that are going to survive planet Earth. And that's the Word of God and the spirit of every man and woman. Those are the only two things that are absolutely going to survive this current world that we're living in. Let me close with this verse. 1 Peter chapter 1, actually two verses, 24 and 25, it says, Oh, I love this one. For all people are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. My God, folks, when you compare our lives to eternity, the backdrop of eternity, we're just like that piece of grass, that beautiful flower that arises in the springtime. But it eventually fades away. But listen to this. Verse 25. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Come on, God's calling us to get in the word, folks. Every one of us. No excuses. I don't know how to read. I don't know how to do this. God will help you do it. I can't focus. Well, God's going to help you. By the way, I... Have a little of that ADD or whatever they, they call it a little bit. So I, I, I listen to the Bible. And that way I can go back. I listen to it on my smart device. I can go back and listen to it again. It's like my mind drifts off. Don't, don't feel bad if when you get into the Word of God or you try to study it or listen to it, that you drift off. You're, you're not unspiritual. We all do that. I can go for segments and like, golly, I was just listening to the Word of God. What did I do there? I was thinking about something else. I'm going to address some of those issues and tell you how to avoid some of those things. Folks, I'm not going to read all these verses to you, but I want to tell you there are six additional benefits to the Word of God. It's found in Psalm 19, verse 7. You can have a restored soul when you get in the Word of God. Your soul can be refreshed. Psalm 119, verse 9 says that when you are involved in the Word, you can can have purity in your life. The Bible will help you stay away from sin and get sin out of your life. Psalm 119, verse 98 says uh, the Word of God gives you wisdom. We all need wisdom. Psalm 119, 105 says that the Word of God gives us guidance. Psalm 119, verse 25 says, My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. You want revival? Do you feel tired and weary? Do you feel spiritually drained and out of it? Get in the word of God and let it revive you. Amen. Finally, Psalm 119, verse 11. I I may have already quoted that one, but but it talks about living a sin-free life. Now give me just a couple of more minutes and listen to me. Because here's the reality, folks. We don't separate ourselves from sin. Sin will separate us from God. Dear ones, you can't have it both ways. If we don't deal with our sin, our sin will deal with us. It will cause us to move away from 
God. So in light of everything that I've stated to you this morning, in light of all that's been stated, what should be our response? Well, there should be a longing for the Word of God. First Peter puts it this way. He says, And like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. We are to long for the Word of God. And folks, listen. I have found that the more you get involved with the Word of God, the more you read it, the more you study it, the more you want it. And folks, when you get away and you drift from the Word of God, it doesn't take very long at all before your, your, your mind and body says, I, 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 I don't want to do that. You know, just this last week that threw a curveball to me and Tracy, you know, we, we were just busy as, I just busy as bees for a while. And it didn't take but a few days. I was like, wow. I, I need to sharpen up here. My flesh was saying, oh, you've been through a little hardship. Why don't you just take off a little while longer? And I knew where that voice came from. Our, and I started praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, I worship you, and I thank you for this new day. God, thank you that you've given me another day to fellowship with the sovereign God, the creator of heaven and earth. Thank you that you're my Father. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done in my life and in my heart. And I started praying again, and I decided, boy, I'm not going to get that busy again. David said it this way in Psalm 42.1. He says, as the deer pants for the water brooks, my soul pants for you, God. Listen to this, and then we'll pray together. Here's, here's, here's a fact. 15 minutes a day in the Bible equals 91 hours a year. You can read through the Bible in one year by devoting 15 minutes a day to it. Now, that, that's doable. But by the way, listen, don't, don't feel like you've got to get through the Bible in one year. I often go through seasons where I'll read the Bible in, in one of those one-year Bibles. And it'll usually take me a couple of years to get through it. So be it. If it takes you three years, four years, five years, just a consistent, steady diet in the Word of God can make all the difference in your life. Amen? Let's stand up for just a moment. I'm going to pray for you. And, and, and basically, I hope what we're all doing is we are hearing the importance of God's Word and we're making a fresh commitment or maybe a commitment for the very first time to the Word of God. And I'm going to pray also for those of you that are, that, are, that are trying to hear God about what He wants you to do in this 21-day fast, that you'll hear God. And, uh, hey, we, we just want to obey God. And we've set this time aside to seek Him and find out His will. And I believe if we'll do some of these things God's instructing us to do, we can secure our future. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I uh, come with your precious children, and we, we just pray together, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word, and we see the importance and the value in your word. And, and Lord, not only value, but God, the living, breathing word of God. Father, I pray that what we've learned today will become an absolute revelation to us. And, and Father, we'll realize that we just got to start. We, we've just got to make some baby steps, Lord, one step at a time. And, and, and Lord, if it's nothing other than just a few minutes a day that we get in the word of God and we read and we study and, and we let you speak to us. But I am praying, Lord, that, that a fresh commitment from all of us would be made to you right now in your presence that we would put the Word of God first. We would make it first place and final authority in our lives. Lord, we love you and thank you for the Word. Jesus, thank you for becoming the Word and, and coming on this earth so we could see literally the Word in action. Father, we love you today. We give you praise and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen.